the pigs, the pigs. We gotta get rid of the pigs, the pigs, the pigs. We gotta get rid of the Before moving into this current apartment, I lived in Harlem for two years, Central Harlem, on 137th Street between 5th and Lenox. It was a fairly small building, six floors with three apartments each, two smaller ones next to each other, and then a larger one across the stairway. I lived in the latter, a four-bedroom apartment with a decently sized kitchen, but nothing that could seriously be considered a living room. It's an odd layout, right? That's not an apartment meant for long-term living. No, it is purpose-built for gentrification. For bringing in four single 20-somethings who want to live in New York City near multiple subway stops, but in a place that's still generally affordable. And so we were, four strangers brought together by a listing agent, each paying a monthly fee for a room rather than an apartment. And I know for a fact that that's what it was because... One of the neighbors told me. He lived in the same numbered apartment a few floors above, but his was a three-bedroom, not four. There was a lot more communal space. It was a home for him and his family, and the building's new owners were trying to make him leave too so they could do the same thing. Add another room, put in some shiny new appliances, and literally, not figuratively, triple the rent before classifying it as stabilized for what I can only assume are tax reasons, despite some real shady shit in the lease, allowing them to increase the actual amount collected even as the market value followed the rent board's determinations of acceptable annual increases. It was gross. But there I was anyway. <laughs> Around the corner was a little storefront that had no sign but was almost always occupied. I'd walk by it a couple times a week and never figured out what exactly it was for. Some nights it was a bar, others a hair salon, one time even a makeshift movie theater. It was a community space, clearly, and its lack of exterior markings a sign that it was for those who were a real part of the community. A place where locals could unwind, drink, talk, dance, live free from the ever-encroaching presence of people like me. I thought about that place a lot while watching Mangrove. Hello, by the way, and welcome to the Week Air Review. You can call me not the right guy for this. Because today, I am starting what will be a five-week series reviewing each part of Steve McQueen's Small Axe anthology of films after their releases on Amazon Prime. Which means this might be the only hashtag content on this channel for the rest of the year. And maybe you're not stoked to hear that. But let's be real. If you're not interested in small acts, you probably shouldn't be here anyway. Mangrove is named for The Mangrove, a real restaurant, then community space in the Notting Hill neighborhood of West London. It was opened in 1968 by a Trinidadian immigrant named Frank Critchlow. It quickly became a place for the locals to come and hang out and drink and dance and eat and be accosted by police. The restaurant's opening is also the film's, and for a while at least, Critchlow is our point of view. We're never told exactly what Critchlow did at his previous spot, the Rio, but some sort of illegal activity got him in trouble and the place shut down. He doesn't want to repeat that experience and intends the mangrove to be meant as a fresh start. This will be a real, respectable restaurant, which makes him all the angrier when local Constable Pulley comes back to tear it all down. He's got a reputation in the neighborhood, and the fact that he's still just a constable well over a decade after joining the force tells you basically everything you need to know. He shows up at the mangrove and asks to be served some white people food, but is told there's nothing there for him to eat. The mangrove only serves authentic West Indian cuisine. Spicy food. And that doesn't sit right with Pulley, who I would say seems cartoonishly racist if he weren't a cop, but since he's a cop, it's definitely exactly correct. What follows are a barrage of legally questionable raids that damage the property and injure its patrons. Critchlow tries to follow the proper procedures, filing official complaints and bringing them up all the way to the local member of parliament, but, of course, he is stonewalled at every point. When he does bring Pulley to court, the judge finds Critchlow instead. 
it's fucking infuriating because he's powerless against the system. In response to all this, activist Darkus Howe wants to stage a demonstration against the violence being perpetrated against the community. Take it to the streets, because no one will hear them otherwise. Although Critchlow doesn't want to draw any more ire than he does by simply existing, all his other options have been exhausted. He relents, and they march. Peacefully, but forcefully. As one would expect from cops, then and there as now and everywhere, they come out for blood and then claim that the whole thing was a riot and that nine in particular should be charged as rioters, a serious offense that would land them substantial prison sentences. These are the Mangrove Nine, and I had never heard of them before watching this film. Indeed, I had never heard of any of this and didn't even know that it was based on a true story until we got some white text on a black screen after the movie was over but before the credits started, letting me know what uh, happened in the years since. This meant that my experience of watching Mangrove was fundamentally different than that of, for example, my English viewers who I would expect to know this story not because they were taught it in school, and thanks to Week I Review superfan Willow for confirming that it was not part of her curriculum, but because the folks who made it this far into the video are likely the type to have sought out their country's history of racial violence and protests, and this one was genuinely important. The Mangrove Nine were tried in the Old Bailey, the courtroom where only the most egregious crimes were adjudicated, and where particularly harsh sentences were given as a result. This was meant as a statement to anyone else who might stand up against state-sanctioned abuse, that they would be crushed under the weight of a society built to colonize their culture, not celebrate it. Instead, this case became the first time that the British court would acknowledge that racism played a role in policing, a landmark moment that I didn't know about. And so I spent the back half of the film in that courtroom very, very tense, because I really didn't know which way things would go. Obviously, it was true that everything Polly and Co. said were lies, but what does that matter? When the prosecutor refers to the peaceful protesters as savages and even animals, I wanted to scream both because Jesus fucking Christ and because it seemed extremely plausible that it wouldn't matter. I mean, that rhetoric is all over the place still, but the general public remains as deferential to law enforcement as ever. I know this is a British movie, but it is real hard to not project it onto what is happening in America too. Mangrove is an ACAB movie. There's no attempt to humanize Pulley or anyone who works with him. The film gives them exactly as much regard as they give the people they're sworn to protect. But it even goes one step further. Early on, we're introduced to the latest recruit to Pulley's team. He's clearly less into the whole arrest the first black man you see ethos of the precinct, but he also doesn't do anything to change it. Even if he does at one point stop a confrontation from turning violent, it's not like he's up on the stand during that trial giving some big speech about how untrustworthy his colleagues are. In fact, we don't really see much of him once things get going because he's just become another faceless part of the system. Which, you know, it's the whole point of the ACAB mantra. It doesn't matter if some police are not actually bad people because they can't rock the boat or speak out against the bad apples inevitably drawn to a profession that lets them abuse and even kill people with near immunity without being ostracized or even endangered on duty. They may not participate in the actions of their colleagues, but... Silence is compliance is acceptance. Being less bad doesn't make you good. And because we don't have to spend a bunch of time with a bunch of garbage, we can spend more time with the folks that matter. The Nine, and everyone else who hangs out at the Mangrove. Apparently, McQueen's father was friends with one of the defendants, so he has a personal connection to the whole thing that pushed him to represent the events and the people within them as accurately as possible. But while old members of the Mangrove Nine are depicted, Mangrove the film really focuses on just four. Critchlow, 
Howe, Barbara Beese, and Althea Jones Laquant. I imagine that an actual series-length depiction of these events would have gone deeper into all of them, but for the sake of the story, this choice makes sense. Critchlow obviously was critical as the owner of the mangrove itself, while Beast made the most iconic image of the march as she held the head of a pig aloft. Additionally, her lawyer helped steer the defense in a way that the court appointed lawyers for the rest just didn't. And she was in a relationship with Howe, who was one of the two defendants to represent himself in court, the other being Jones Laquant. And that self-representation was critical to this case because it allowed these two, both great speakers, to really get at the truth of what was happening in a way that a white man wearing a wig never could. Some of the film's most cathartic moments come when Howe and Jones Laquant are speaking to the court or ripping the prosecution to gosh damn shreds. And we linger on many of these moments. McQueen just loves to do that, to make his shots a little bit longer than you'd expect to really emphasize them. I mean, that's basically all Hunger was, right? McQueen's debut is most famous for the 17-minute static shot at its center, a simple conversation that plays out like something you'd see on stage. And I've read fairly compelling arguments for why this scene is actively bad from a cinematic perspective, because it diminishes the potential impact of the scene by hiding half of each performer's face for the duration. But also, I don't care. I love it. Just like I love Carrie Mulligan singing the entirety of New York, New York in close-up in shame, and etc., etc., Maybe it's because I really, really love theater, and gosh, do I miss it right now. But McQueen's brand of long takes just works for me, and his use here is as adept as ever. Sometimes we're in motion alongside characters, but others we just sit and watch as scenes play out with no camera moves or editing. A particularly poignant moment comes at the end of a raid. We're in the mangrove's kitchen downstairs watching a bowl that was knocked onto the floor as it finally comes to a stop. Have you ever waited for a bowl to stop naturally? It takes forever. But it's what we need after that moment of chaos. Time to sit and wait for this final piece to settle before we can actually deal with what's happened, the violations at the hands of the state. And it makes you angry even if you don't know it's true. We see the community that forms around the mangrove, the joy that it brings to people to have a place where they can just be. There's a scene right near the beginning where the restaurant's patrons go out into the street to dance and the whole thing just looks so fun, you know? You want to be there and dance with them too. And that's when we see Polly for the first time, watching, fuming, making very clear that he hates these people and their way of life. It shatters the joy, but Mangrove is all about the fight to get it back, to not let thugs like Pulley keep anyone from living their lives in a way that isn't harming anything but a white man's fragility. Because we really are fragile. 9.0 out of 10. Thanks so much for watching, and thank you particularly to my patrons, my mom, Hammer and Marco, Kat Saracata, Benjamin Schiff, Anthony Cole, Magnolia Denton, Elliot Fowler, Greg Lucina, Werner van Alphen, Liam Knipp, Kojo, and Phil Bates. If you like this video, that's great. If not, you're going to hate this channel for the rest of the year. <laughs> if you want to see more, please subscribe. I hope to see you next week.